Hey everyone, I'm Israel and I work as an Android engineer in Fabric, uh, mainly contributing to digits. Uh, my name is Ty. Uh, I also work as an Android engineer. Uh, I work on the Fabric platform itself. Uh, you'll hear a little more about how we split those out as we go into this. Uh, now that you've heard about Fabric from Bear at a high level, we'll, we're going to talk about some of the learnings we gained from building it and then how you guys could take some of those same want learnings and apply them either to your own SDKs or libraries or even your own applications for better performance. Before we hop into code though, we should probably think about a few considerations you might want to make before you decide to build an SDK or a library. First consideration that you need to make is, uh, you know, what need are you actually serving with this? Is this for your internal users? Is this for, you know, another development team at your company? Is this for public developers? Who's going to be using this and what's the value that you're actually adding? Next thing you need to consider really is that there are uh, multiple ways to deliver your code for another Android app to consider. Uh, there's really kind of four types of, of formats. Um, the first one's a library project. It's most standard in Android. It's the oldest. It's uh, just a workspace that you could include that includes source code and resources. Um, it's great. It's super flexible. But it's, uh, you know what happens when the developer that's including you modifies it? How do they stay on the update path? How do they get, uh, you know, how do they keep up with support? That can become problematic. We also have jars. Uh, jars are great as well, you know, super old, Java from the beginning. But there's no way to include Android resource files with them. And so it rules it out for any library that may be view related. Oops. There we go. Uh, next you need to really consider, um, Sorry, I didn't mean to click next. Um, <laughs> then we have APK libs. Uh, APK libs were kind of a community driven effort that popped up around the time of people using Maven to build Android before Gradle really had official adoption. Um, it was kind of just a zipped version of a library project that included resources. It worked, but it's not really widely supported now and I wouldn't recommend using it since Gradle is now the official way of doing things. Uh, lastly, there are AARs. AARs are really the current recommended approach by Google because they tie tightly to, to Gradle. Uh, what, it's very similar to an APK lib, actually. They're a zipped uh, archive that it contains compiled sources as opposed to source code itself, uh, as well as all the resource files. The downside is that Eclipse isn't yet supported for AARs, and a lot of you, you know, up and coming Android developers or professional Android developers say, well, Eclipse doesn't matter anyway. Uh, unfortunately, quite a few of our users uh, of our developers are on Eclipse. Uh, it would surprise a lot of you. And so, you know, we couldn't just abandon those people. But we did decide on Fabric to, to use AARs and we went ahead and we built backwards compatibility into our Eclipse plugin for Fabric to handle the AAR format. It automatically unzips it, it creates a workspace project in Eclipse, it injects the jar, it injects the resources, and then uh, you know, it has Ivy bundled with the plugin so it can resolve our Maven repository and it can get the latest updates. And uh, we handle that all, that all that for the developer. Uh, next thing you really need to consider if you're going to build your own library is your licensing. Uh, and if you want to go open or closed source. Uh, open source is amazing, right? You know, you're going to get a lot of community contribution. You'll have wider adoption. You'll probably get more stable software with other people submitting patches and finding issues. And oftentimes you'll get more enthusiastic engineers on your own team because they want to work on something that's getting exposure. Um, but it's generally, it might not always be a question solely from an engineering perspective, it could be a product perspective as well. For example, what if you have an SDK that ties tightly with an API backend and a dashboard, and then what do you want to expose? What do you want to show? What's the value in the, the client itself versus the backend? Those are just some considerations about that you need to make. Um, but if you do decide to, to open source it, then you need to consider your licensing as well. Uh, GPL licensing is kind of, it, it may force consumers, in, or by consumers I mean your app developers, to also have to license that way. It's very restrictive. Uh, so I'd recommend a more flexible license, something like MIT or Apache 2. Just some things to keep in mind. Lastly, you want to consider where you're hosting the artifacts to be consumed. Uh, Maven Central and JSON are standard repos that get referenced out of, in most build tools out of the box. Uh, but unfortunately, if you're not open source, you can't include them in there by default because they require open source licensing. This is to protect the users of that service so they don't accidentally pull down some artifact that the terms of service, uh, that they haven't agreed to the terms of service for. Um, so if you choose not to, then you need to host your own Maven repository or use a hosted solution like Artifactory and inform the user that they need to reference that repo URL as well. Okay, so you figured out your product strategy. You said, 
all that's fine. I want to build an awesome SDK or a library and deliver it to other app developers. So let's talk about a couple of the, the qualities that when we were building Fabric we thought about and uh, how you guys can focus on this too. So what does it, sorry, whoa, I forget that. So what does it make an SDK powerful? To us, uh, mean that is easy to integrate into existing a app, has a good API, handles uh, failure gracefully, and it's flexible to detect on runtime libraries, permissions, and features. Nobody makes a constructor with 15 parameters with no documentation or test on purpose. That's what I like to think. Uh, nobody makes a hard SDK because they won't. Uh, it just happened because of the lack of rigor. So from the very beginning, we decided, we decided whoa, that Fabric had to be easy to use. Therefore, we made conscious decisions during its design. An example is this line right here. We wanted to have a, the easiest way possible to start Fabric. Fabric initialization is just this one line. You just need to pass the Android context and then the kit that you want to use or the kits that you want to use and then just run with it. This is another example of easy integration. With Fabric, you need to use an API key. That API key is a dependency to authenticate against our web services. As you can see in the example, our approach is to provision the key through our uh, IDE plugins and inject it on the Android manifest. During the initialization, we get the application info and we retrieve, and we retrieve the API key. So the init process is the init process can continue. We allow alternative approach to manage the API key that were there for open source libraries. You can create a properties file and we will read it. As you see in that example, we, have, uh, we get a context, but we use the application context. Uh, we only capture the application context to prevent memory leaks that can be caused if you, refer if you reference an, an activity that is being killed. In some other parts of our code, we use an activity but we also we reference it so we avoid the memory leaks. Another good example of uh, detecting dependencies, we have this uh, class Twitter API client, which responsibility is to make Twitter API calls, that's pretty clear on the name. But for doing that, it, for doing that, it needs a session. So we give the uh, developer the opportunity to pass the session through the constructor, but if they don't want, what we do is we get the active session from the session manager on the, on, inside Fabric. You may say, hey, why you don't, why you don't use a dependency in injection framework? Well, that's, that's a good suggestion for an app and I will love to use it. But however, the second quality that we really think it's key for a good SDK is uh, lightweight. And lightweight means that we cannot take extra dependencies that easy. We have to study the size in order to uh, see if we can integrate in our SDK. Another thing that was really important to us is that SDKs are modular and extensible because developers all have unique needs. We introduced the concept of kits as these separate product or functional units so developers can own only the pieces of code that they need to their application without having unused code sitting around that they needed to strip out with ProGuard or something else. Um, but we really wanted them to be able to easily update their application in the future with the new features that we push out. Existing Crashlytics users may, recommend, may recognize this first line of this example, Crashlytics.start. It was just a super easy way to get up and running with Crashlytics, just like we have the easy way to get up with Fabric today. Uh, but we took you know, some other uh, configuration options as well. Uh, and you can see these here. And you can tell that they were added over time and that they were added in different styles. Uh, some of these allow you to set a you know, custom SSL pin or set a listener so that you're notified when your app previously crashed. Uh, but aside from being inconsistent, one of the other things you may not notice is the intention behind these um, when you need to call them specifically. Uh, you wouldn't know it without looking at Javadocs, but you need to call them before Crashlytics starts, otherwise it's not going to take advantage of them. So let's try to make this better. If we need all these parameters to be called before we start, <laughs> yeah, right, right? It's the perfect time. There we go. If we need them all to uh, be called before we start, why don't we just add them all to the method, right? That's, that makes sense. And then when we add more functionality to Crashlytics, we'll just keep tacking on parameters. Everyone loves a series of meaningless nulls or ints. Now there's got to be a better way. Uh, so we decided to uh, use the Fluent Builder pattern, uh, where you can specify additional and optional parameters for each kit. This pattern helps alleviate the burden of having methods or constructors with many inputs. 
And it also ensures that the kits are initialized and are in an immutable state so that when Fabric uses them, they're thread safe. And we didn't just leave that in the kits. We also extended that builder pattern to Fabric itself. So if you don't want to just use Fabric with that one line, we allow you to pass in the builder object as well where you can specify a lot of additional information. You can turn on debug mode, you can pass your own you know, thread pull executor, you can put in uh, your own looper or uh, set, set your custom logger. The goal here was to make it stupidly easy for developers to get started right away, but give Android experts the flexibility they might need for their, for their needs. Part of the extensible code is allowing the developer to choose when to be notified when certain behavior happens. And here's an example of us initializing Fabric with a builder pattern. And we can set an initialization callback that notifies the app developer once all the synchronous and the asynchronous setup of Fabric is done. Uh, or you know, maybe there were some failure conditions and we need to notify on those as well. Developers have quite a range of tools and therefore they need a lot of flexibility in their code. We provide extensible interfaces that the developer can utilize. One example is logging. It can be done with many different libraries. You know, some people use Timber, some people use Logcat, some people use Log4j Android. Um, but we wanted to provide a custom logging interface that allowed the developer to use their own preferred tools. And so we want to respect their preferences and that's what we provide in Fabric. They can override this interface, provide their own implementation of these, and we'll use that through the entire SDK platform and every kit. But if the developer chooses not to implement their own logging interface, we provide a safe default that takes advantage of the standard Android logger. So they're good to go anyway. Here's another great example from Fabric. Uh, it's popped up a little bit earlier with our API client, but I'll go into a little more detail on that now. The Twitter kit provides this API client that has some of the most popular Twitter endpoints defined. And it uses that session that Israel pointed out earlier to automatically do the signing for you. So it makes it extremely easy to hit any of the endpoints. But there's a ton of Twitter endpoints, and we didn't think it was valuable to include all of those out of the box right now. Um, but if you had a very, if you had a little more, um, you know, uh, unknown endpoint or something that wasn't used as commonly, and you want to take advantage of it, we allow you to do that. We didn't want to have to, you, we didn't want you to have to re-implement our entire client, so we made this extensible. You can extend the Twitter API client and use your own retrofit style interfaces with the annotations, and we'll handle it all for you. More than just code, Java code, a good library has views that can allow style properties to be overridden as well. This example is taken from our tweet view from the Twitter UI kit. The developer can customize various colors that they use in rendering the tweet. One important note is that Dex merging doesn't namespace for libraries. So if you don't namespace all these styles directly in these attributes, it's quite easy to conflict with the developer unintentionally. If you named something very uh, you know, generic, if you had a color called title color, it's very likely you'll conflict and unintentionally you'll inherit their, quality, their color quality. Aside from implementation details we just talked about, it's in, we, when designing a, our APIs, we generally think about a few traits. Uh, the first is being intuitive. An API should act the way a developer expects without having to reference documentation. Your SDK should have, your SDK should have a consistent API. Name your methods in a similar way. Provide similar design patterns throughout. Use common language. Don't name the success method in a network callback success and the success for a database operation on success. An API should be easy to use and it should be hard to misuse. Validate your inputs. Have same defaults, especially when dependencies aren't provided. Make the developer using your SDK feel safe and give them an understanding to what's going on. So let's, let's talk now about handling failure. As SDK developers, we deal with a lot of uncertainty because we don't know what is going to be built on the top of our SDK. But when there is no doubt of what the SDK should expect or should be have, we approach by failing fast before the code goes into the wild. So let's see an example. But before that, your SDK should never fail in production. That, that is a really bad idea, guys. Preserving the trust of developers is the only way to keep your code in the app. However, fail fast so the developer can know where the, when, when when there is a problem very quickly. In that case, if a developer tries to set a logger null, or builder will throw an exception so they can quickly understand what is going on and they can fix it. We gracefully degrade it. That means that if it's in the bug mode, we are, throw a, we are gonna throw a clear exception, but 
we are going to hide the problem on production uh, and allow the rest of the application to continue running so we don't crash the application. I don't think we need help to write a crashy app, uh, including myself. So uh, <laughs> uh, let's try that the RDS SDK doesn't crash too much. Your SDK usually doesn't have the same luxuries as an application. You don't get to pick and choose your devices, your API levels, or even your target customer. As an SDK developer, you need to provide maximum flexibility. So the developer never has to make trade-offs when deciding on your library versus a competitor. Have you ever checked out an app in Google Play and thought to yourself, why does this flashlight app need to delete the contents of my USB storage? <laughs> Permissions are powerful, and they allow you to integrate deeply with the OS and the device. But they can seem really scary to users that don't understand why your app, how your app uses that specific permission. And if permissions are added after the first launch of your application, they, they'll break auto updates in Google Play for the users. And we've seen this slow adoption of new versions of apps really heavily. Um, in general, apps and especially SDKs should limit the number of permissions. The Crashlytics kit requires just one permission. And then we provide hooks for developers to set additional email. That one permission we require is internet, of course. In our SDK, uh, if our SDK wanted to capture the user's email, for example, so that the developer can see that in the crash report and they can contact them and say, hey, I'm sorry, your app crashed. Can you help me reproduce this, please? Um, we'd have to require a really scary permission, like get accounts. And I think a lot of, develop a lot of users would be really afraid of that. Your application would have to declare it. It'd be tough. Um, instead, our SDK allows developers to set that through an additional hook. They can choose to get that information by putting that in or acquiring it another way. Maybe they want to prompt the user for it. And then they can set that on Crashlytics at runtime as a custom key. And then we can see that in the log. Sorry, then you as the developers can see that in the log in Crashlytics. <laughs> in order for an SDK to be robust, it should take advantage of features when they're available. And that's where runtime permission detection comes in handy. Uh, as this example, uh, you know, we, we don't want to go ahead and try to upload the Crashlytics crash reports if there's no network access available. That's just a waste of resources. And so we'll go ahead and we'll check the network state. If the permission isn't already granted, though, and we try to do it without this check, we just cause a Java security exception and it would crash. So the SDK can check it at runtime to determine if the permission's granted and use the certain APIs if they are. And then we have a graceful fallback if, it's, if we don't have the permission. The graceful fallback might be kind of common sense. It's we try to upload anyway because we don't know if there's a network connection or not. So we're just going to try to give the crash up. Um, like permissions, though, uh, feature detection is another powerful, uh, features are another powerful aspect of Android manifests. For example, maybe you want to use the camera. You'll be de tempted to declare that in your manifest. But if you specify required, it requires Google Play not to list the app to any devices that don't have a camera. I encourage you to instead list the features optional, if possible, and allow your app to detect it and then adjust its behavior at runtime. Detecting the feature at runtime is really simple. You just query the package manager for the specific feature to find if it exists. Now your app can determine which functionality to enable. Take a social camera app for an example. Maybe you don't have the camera, so they can't post it from there, but you still want to allow the users to browse the photos and maybe upload a, uh, an image from their gallery. Another important part of runtime detection is detecting the Android version. Uh, you need to be able to detect that so you can make specific API calls, of course. Uh, in this specific example, we needed the build hardware. This is you know, one of the fields that we upload for, for Crashlytics so that the you as the developer can see this in your dashboard. But if we don't have it because we're not Froyo or above, then we're not going to be able to provide that, so we just provide empty data. Detect detecting some Android components can be a bit more challenging. Speech detection, for example, isn't just relying on an Android version or a permission or a feature, but it is a specific service that's installed on the device. And so we can detect that uh, by trying to start an activity for a specific intent and then catching the exception. Or a more elegant way is we can <laughs> define the intent, and then we can query the package manager for that, and then iterate on the result list. And if there's anything in there, then we know that there is an activity that can handle the speech detection intent. When providing your SDK to developers, it's tempting to want to use awesome new libraries. Maybe you want to provide RxJava support or OKHttp OK support. But you don't want 
a third party dependency on that necessarily. You don't want, Rx Java is pretty big. You don't want your app developer to have to include that just so you can use a couple of cool observables of a stream. Um, so in this example, this is uh, something we do in Fabric. We want to use OK HTTP if it exists. It's an awesome HTTP library. Uh, we check at runtime to see if it's available on the class path. And we return true. And if it's not, then we return false. And we, uh, you'll see in the, the bottom line there, this is a Gradle dependency. We don't specify compiled, because then it would be a transitive dependency. We specify provided as the scope. That way, we compile against it, but we don't require the developer's application to package it. If you were using Maven, you could use the optional flag as well. It's another way to do that. Like I said, it, we use that specifically in Fabric today in our Twitter API client. Uh, if we have that, then we'll use our OK client, which uh, is part of Retrofit. And if not, then we'll go ahead and fall back to the URL connection client. This gives developers more power based on their own configuration. OK, so let's talk about a really important topic. I hope you are all agree with me that testing is really good and it's really important for us and help us to sleep well at night. No, uh, I, I, I don't agree. Like, we, we don't test. What are you talking about? <laughs> Get no, out no, of here. No, it's a waste of time, right? Come on. Let's, let's not talk about this right now. Uh, <laughs> Convince me. <laughs> well, I can say Digit has 86% of code coverage, so don't worry about that, guys. <laughs> uh, so um, as I was saying, uh, when you make an SDK, you want to make the SDK testable. You, so the developers that are using our, your SDK can uh, test the interaction with that SDK classes. Uh, you don't want to be making SDK, you don't want to use the SDK and making network calls during their unit test. So uh, what we have to do is do our SDK testable or mockable. And a mock class is a simulated object, uh, use it to verify the behavior. And or an object that, oh, sorry, a mock class is a, a simulated object, use it to verify the behavior of an object that depends on it. There are, here there are some tricks that uh, you can use to make an SDK t uh, mockable or testable or both. So by avoiding a stick method, you allow any method called to operate on the mock instance. Um, if you're going to utilize, utilize a, st a static method, make sure that they can be tested in isolation and all our dependencies are, are provided up front. Uh, many mocking libraries doesn't mock final classes, so try to avoid them. Final means that it cannot be extended, so do you really want to do that? Uh, avoid public. Avoid to use public fields in your code too, because these public fields doesn't exist on the mock classes. So, just use a method to access to them. It's much easier to set up classes to test if your public API uses interfaces. The interfaces allow the developer to simulate the behavior that they want. They can hit their mock servers or the memory storage instead of expensive input-output operations. Lastly, uh, think about providing separate testing artifact that gives the developer more powerful injections or manipulations uh, on the test environment. Okay, let me put you a really clear example of a hard to test class. So if you, are, if you have a class that depends on this Twitter class, uh, well, you're gonna have a hard time trying to test this. Uh, it's final, so you cannot mock it. Well, you can mock it with power mock, but it's okay. Uh, in general, if you use another library, you're not going to be able to do it. And then you have that uh, singleton pattern, uh, which I recommend not to use. Uh, so how, do, how can we test that? So I recommend it changes. Uh, remove the final so you can extend the class and just make a normal instant class and get the dependencies on the, on the, on the constructor so you can inject them and uh, test in isolation your class. Uh, this will be how you will test it. You just mock Twitter class and then you test the interaction with that class uh, really easily. So we talked to you about the importance of an easy integration, uh, extensibility of the API, runtime permissions. But next, we are going to be talking about an SDK has to be also not only powerful, but also lightweight. So during the process of building Fabric, we learned the importance of creating SDKs that are lightweight. Again, all of these lessons learned during, the build, during this process can be applied to applications too. The important considerations for building a lightweight SDK are the binary size, watching out the WIG method count, limiting the network usage, encouraging modularity, and optimizing the startup time. So let's talk about binary size. 
Users are less likely to download your big apps, and this means that binary size matters. Think about it. Uh, how many of you has an unlimited data plan? Nobody? Come on, guys. <laughs> well, the, it's not so many, and you are in the US, so think about that countries where there is no that plans. So many users are going to be paying per kilobyte. Uh, so the loads cost them money, even if your app is free. Even some markets has a slow data connection, so they're going to that the load is, that the load is going to take so much time that they're just going to say, yeah, I'm not going to do that this. So, you know, there is great third-party libraries that, that can impact uh, really positively in your application, like Protobuf. Uh, in Crosslytics, uh, we use Protobuf. Proto protocol buffers is a binarization protocol that creates small objects for efficient transfer and quick read and, and write. The Java library, though, it's 700 kilobytes, and that's much larger than the current size of our SDK. So that's big for an SDK. So we decided to reinvent the wheel and write it ourselves, but that, worth, that was worth it because it only took us 10 kilobytes to rewrite it because we didn't need to use a lot of the functionality on that library. So as SDK developer, we want make the SDK as lightweight as possible so they don't have a big APK. So how we do that? We, we have this Gradle task that report the binary size. Uh, and we have this running for each bill. That's important. These two lines are important. Oops, sorry about the laser. <laughs> <laughs> that, these two lines are important. What we do is actually we build two applications, one with the SDK and one without, the, without it. And this gives us a real impact on the size of an application, not, actu not the actual active size. And it is really important. So what we do is we automate this so we can see the trending on the, of the size so we can take care of this problem sooner than later. Automate all the things, guys. So Dalvik method count. Does anybody hit the Dalvik limit? Come on. Come on. <laughs> OK. So uh, for those who don't know about this problem, uh, there is actually a 65k limit on the number of method invocations allowed that can be referenced in a single DEX file. Uh, a little bit more, but around 65,000. Uh, so you can now use multi-DEX, uh, but out of the box, uh, it seems setting some overhead on the uploading time. And it only works for the latest uh, Gradle versions. Um, and you know, how many developers are really going to hack around with DEX and dynamic loading of DEX files? They're probably going to take a look at, your, at the SDKs and they're going to see what are the bigger ones and they, OK, what is the alternative to this that is less big? So our advice is uh, to limit your impact um, by being extremely modular and lean. And Ty will, be, will talk uh, about this in a little bit. So uh, wait. Oh, yeah. So this is what we use. Uh, this is the great, a great library build. Uh, by an engineering quip. Uh, it wraps some Android build tools and it gives you a detailed data of method count per package. Again, we automate this with, in the CI, so we get this, per, this data for each, uh, each build. So we are able to see the trend and we can tackle these problems sooner than later because when it's too late, they're going to replace you for another SDK. So let's talk about now about network. Um, Network communication should be min minimized as much as possible because it impacts the battery life and then s some people data plans too. So uh, as I mentioned early, uh, Crashlytic user protobuf. Uh, the reason for this is that it's especially small compared to XML. Pro protocol buff, uh, protobuf uses a protocol format that both the sender and the receiver agree on. Therefore, the amount of information that has to be packed is smaller. It's actually 10 times smaller than XML. But then, it's even, com it's even compiled in binary. Therefore, it's super faster compared to XML when parsing or we're serializing or deserializing. It's actually 100 times faster. <coughs> so our advice is to consider exactly what kind of network request you need. Uh, compact them as much as possible. And you know, remember that some, some of the users will be paying kilobyte for everything that you transmit. And now let's talk about uh, the cell radio. The cell radio is one of the biggest sources of battery drain. 
So making sure we are transmi transmi transmitting efficiently, it's key to avoid the, dr the battery draining. The, the cell radio has in three energy states, full power, low power, and standby. Every time you create a new connection, the radio transmissions move to the full, st full power state, and it remains there until the, tra the transfer is done. Then it takes five seconds to transition to the low power, and then 12 seconds, sorry, five seconds on the full power, and then 12, 12 seconds to move to the lower energy state. Uh, so for a typical 3G device, every data transfer session will cause the radio to draw energy for almost 20 seconds. That means three connections per minute will make the cell radio perpetually active. And that's draining a lot of battery. So by batching those three connections together, we can reduce around 20 seconds of an enabled radio and then give in 40 seconds of idle time. When we started Fabric, a huge concern for us was to provide the maximum amount of modularity so our developers could pick and choose only the specific features that they were interested in. We wanted to take advantage of the standard dependency management tools like Gradle or Maven, and uh, we wanted to use transitive dependencies as well. Even though we wanted modularity for developers who needed specific functionality, we wanted simplicity for the developers that wanted entire sets of features to be up and running in no time. This diagram represents how we architected Fabric to support the two goals I just talked about. At the base level, we provide just one artifact, which is the Fabric artist artifact itself, Fabric.aar. And it's a transitive dependency from all of the kits that sit on top of it, the other artifacts. It contains the common code used for transitive dependencies. It's things like uh, interaction with the web dashboard, app onboarding, events management, caching, and more. At the next level up, we have uh, part of, we, we have this, uh, commonly grouped code for the specific set of features that are grouped together. Uh, so we call this the core level. Um, this could be specific networking or authentication code. It could be uh, modifications on persistence or anything else that's a little more feature specific. The features level is exactly that. It's a set of features that the developer wants to utilize, either as a group or individually. These are generally the features that the developer is choosing to use for their application specifically. Think crash reporting or analytics or digits here. Lastly, we have the interface level, which has all the dependencies on all the features uh, that, that we just mentioned. And it allows for quick access into them for the developer who wants this entire pillar of features. Next, let's see how that works in implementation. So here's the Twitter kit, the architecture for the Twitter kit. Twitter Core is one AAR that provides API, session management, and OAuth. Tweet UI, Tweet Composer, and Digits are all features that the developer can use exclusively. Tweet UI allows for embeddable tweet views and timelines. Tweet Composer provides an intent wrapper to interact with the Android app or uh, create tweets directly to the, the browser. Uh, Digits provides a sign-in with phone number interface that utilizes Twitter's Digits, SMS Digits. infrastructure. Sorry. And it uh, supports over 200 countries, like Bear said. The Twitter AAR is just an interface that allows the developer to access all the functionality that we talked about in all the features uh, as easy as possible and from one location. With that previous chart in mind, let's talk about how big Fabric is total. Because it's modular, you can independently use these pieces of functionality. You don't have to use that entire kit. But if you wanted just to use Fabric and crash reporting, you're less than 300K. If you wanted to use everything on this page, you're still less than a meg. You can pick and choose, though. With Fabric, our goal is to quickly get set up and sit quietly in the background doing nothing unless we're needed, and having negligible impact on startup time of the application. <coughs> There's a small amount of work that needs to be done synchronously for that to happen. Uh, and things like installing the exception handler for Crashlytics so that you know if a crash immediately happens, you're just gonna get caught. Uh, but everything else is delegated to asynchronous initialization. And we do that in a separate thread. Because our SDK is likely initialized in the application, la application on create or the launch of an activity, anything that's done on the main threat is a threat to startup time. SDK should start a separate thread or async task as soon as possible to minimize that impact. Even better if your SDK uses a thread executor to keep the number of threads running to a minimum. Although it's more complicated than an async task, you might want to instead create your own thread factory class. And if you do, be sure to set the thread priority to background priority by set thread priority method and passing the thread priority background parameter. If you don't set this, then you're going to be, even though you're not running on the main thread, you're running at the same priority as the main thread, and it's still possible to cause UI frame skipping. 
When we were developing Fabric and coming from our experience with Crashlytics, we put a huge focus on startup time. With Crashlytics, it's recommended the developer initialize the SDK as early as possible so we can catch startup exceptions. Many developers were fearful this would slow down an app startup. We addressed that through some specific techniques. For all the kits being initialized with Fabric, we have shared concurrency resources that, so we don't overwhelm an app with new threads. It's pretty important that we get out of the way as soon as possible, so all the SDKs are designed to delegate all heavy operations to asynchronous. The code path is returned immediately to the user after the synchronous initialization, and we don't inhibit startup time. The SDK is then in a prime state and can be used immediately, while some work will be queued until the asynchronous is done, and the developer should be none the wiser. In developing an initialization system that supported both async and synchronous startup, we found it very important to support priority so that some things were more important than others. We wanted the crash handler set up and going right away, uh, probably before embedding a tweet. This is a requirement for us, so we implemented a priority system in our own threadful executor that's used across Fabric. Lastly, uh, at this point, we're dealing with synchronous and asynchronous code. We're dealing with entire sets of kits that need to be initialized. Sometimes there's order. Priority is not enough. We need a specific order for these. Uh, so we developed a dependency system that we use as well. This is all part of our Threadful Executor. This allows a specific kit to say that it depends on another kit and you guarantee the initialization order is going to run. Things like uh, you know, Crashlytics is always going to run and install the crash handler so that you catch crashes as early as possible before anything else is going to run. OK, we saw how binary size, being mindful of libraries, watching out for a Dalvik method count, the network usage, modularity, and startup time all have positive impact on the app and the SDK. And it can really be the, some, the reason someone decides to use it or, or not use your SDK. But we need to talk about one more topic that's important, a little more administrative. We can create a powerful and lightweight SDK, but just like with an app, creating it is just the first step. Following that, you need to get it into the hands of developers, get feedback, and iterate. A saying I like is that an API is like a baby. It's fun to make, but you have to support it for 18 years. <laughs> <laughs> Any API you add will require support for future releases. Think about how it will affect your roadmap and the architecture choices that you make. Documentation is extremely important. Uh, both Javadocs and README type examples are really important for developers to learn your library. Document every public method. Document expected use cases. Keep a minimalist approach to sample code. It will be referenced for usage. People will copy and paste it. So keep it as concise as possible so people aren't introducing additional bugs just because you wanted to show off how your image loader built an entire fancy gallery that had Dropbox integration. Deprecation, uh, inevitably you release 1.0 and the internet hates you and your library. You wipe away your tears, you rewatch this video, and you start <laughs> on version two. Uh, so be nice to your developers. Instead of just removing a method in this new version, mark it as deprecated. Set a roadmap for removal and communicate it to your users. Think really hard about introducing public methods. You'll have to maintain them for a while. And when in doubt, leave it out. Thanks so much for coming to hear about how the Fabric team creates lightweight and powerful SDKs. Uh, I hope you've learned a thing or two about our experience building Fabric and that you can take some of that and uh, put it to advantage in your own SDK or app and make them more efficient. Thank you.